It's good to see everyone this evening. I hope everyone able to have a pleasant afternoon, somewhat rainy, somewhat cloudy, but I told Jennifer it was a good day for a nap um, to worship the Lord and then rest this afternoon. So I hope you're able to do that, perhaps, and enjoy some time with family. In one of our daily videos from this past week, the subject was the scripture reading. And if you happen to watch those videos, some of this is going to be repetition to you, but folks, some folks don't, uh, many folks don't watch the videos, so I wanted to share some of the thoughts from that study. From John chapter 20 and 21, where Steve read just a moment ago, what we see, you have that idea that Jesus did many other things that are not recorded. And these things were recorded for a reason, that we may believe, as it says in John 20, there in verses 30 and 31. Um, the end of John 21, you have somewhat of an echo of the same thing. There are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. To think about that idea, one thing that that makes us do is it makes us recognize the things that were, that were written, the things that were recorded, and we've touched on this before, there had to have been a reason for it then. We may not always know the reason, but there, it's not just random events in the Bible. There's a reason. He did so much. He did so many things that we, we don't even have it written down. But the things that we do have written down, they're written that we may believe. And to just think about it, I'll give you one example of that, and it's on the back page of the bulletin today. Paul's shipwreck at the end of Acts, that very easily could have been omitted from Scripture without blinking an eye, frankly. When, when Paul's in that shipwreck, where is, Paul, where is Paul going to? He's going to Rome, right? That's where he's going. The end of Acts, where do we see Paul at? He's in Rome. Okay, so he departs for Rome, and he eventually gets to Rome. So did the shipwreck in any way change his destination? No, he got to Rome. Okay, so it, that's why I say it very easily could have been omitted, and we wouldn't have the record of it. Okay, so that makes us ask the question, well, why record it then? If it didn't change the destination, why record it? There must be a reason. And you might just um, read the back page of the bulletin to explore that a little bit. I'll simply say this. Do we all face storms in life? Yeah. So you might consider why, why it was recorded. But I was thinking about a, another, um, perhaps more obvious question. Beyond just, okay, to think about why were the things recorded, another obvious question is, well, why not write more? He did more. Obviously, he did more. That's the point of those passages. So, so why not write more? Now, the simplest answer to that is, well, it's because the Lord didn't want to. <laughs> the Holy Spirit didn't want to. Now, that is a very simple answer. That's a very simple answer. And sometimes the simplest answers are best, but it really doesn't get into the why behind it. To really to think about, it, well, because, you know, it's sort of like dealing with kids. You know, when your kid says, well, why do I need to do this? And sometimes what's the parent's answer? Because I said so. And sometimes what's their comeback? Well, yeah, but why? <laughs> there is a reason behind it, and it's more than just because God said so. There, there's a reason behind it. So to just think about it from, from Scripture, I would suggest one reason is this. Why not write more? Would it really matter to believers? Would it really matter to believers? To think about it, here in John 20, verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This is enough evidence. The Word of God is enough evidence to convince, to convince those who are honest, those who are seeking the truth. It is enough. In Scripture, you might look back in John chapter 1. Because some did not even require this much, frankly. In John chapter 1, when Jesus first meets Nathanael in John chapter 1 at verse 48, John 1 verse 48, remember Nathanael was the fellow who Philip went and, went and told him um, about Jesus. Philip says, verse 45, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? Philip says, Come and see, verse 47. 
Jesus saw Nathanael coming, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathanael's reply to all of this, when Jesus says, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael's answer is, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Did Nathanael need all of Scripture laid out before him, the whole New Testament, all the miracles, all the teachings, everything, so that he would come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God? No. How many miracles did he need? <laughs> one. He was convinced. Here in John chapter 1, it was enough for him, and he believed it. So some people didn't even need the whole thing. But to think about it, to think about these individuals that we read about in Scripture, all the individuals that we read about, with their backgrounds, with their doubts. Here Nathaniel is, and Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Thomas, there Thomas is. I'm not going to believe it unless I see it for myself. We have all these individuals with their different, different backgrounds, with their doubts that they may have had, with their different preconceptions, with all of these different variables. We have their testimonies and the testimonies that were recorded about them. And it is enough for those who would believe. It's enough, right? So to think about it, to think about why not write more, to think about the purpose, and I tell you what, go ahead and come to James chapter 1. As we think about it is enough, it is enough for believers, for those who are honestly seeking. In, in James chapter 1, I want you to consider James 1 verse 5. Because this, this subject that James talks about is, I think it might be part of this discussion. James 1 verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Is it okay to have doubts? Well, it depends on what the doubts are about. I think it's, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Okay, that fellow who said that believed something, but he was having trouble with something else. And I think you can say the same thing for us. We believe something, but we may have doubts about other things. And James here, I think, is addressing that. There are some doubts that, frankly, we cannot have. There are some doubts we cannot have, and what is it? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe it? Right? I'm, I may have a lot of doubts about a lot of other things, but do we believe that Jesus is the Christ? Is that solid? Is that solid? And, and to think about it um, for, this for this discussion, that's one thing James talks about. Eh, it, if we ask, we have to ask in faith with no doubt. We may have doubts about other things, but then it's like that man, Lord, I believe, help my, help my unbelief. To believers, that faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that is foundational. And that, that idea, that faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that faith right there is not like our bed that needs to be remade every day. We believe it. We believe it. We believe it based on what we read, right? As you think about faith, it comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, here's my point. You either believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or you don't, okay? Would more Scripture, Chuck, I'm going to use you, seeing how you're looking right at me. Sorry. Don't look away. <laughs> If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is more Scripture going to convince you any more? I mean, this is, this is like a 100%, like right? The mathematical equation of it. Is it possible to do anything 110%? Mathematically. It's like, no, it's 100%. Right? So when people say, oh, I'm going to give it 110%. No, you're going to give it at most 100%. You either believe it or you come short of it. So if more was going to be written, is it going to convince you any more that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? No, this is written, according to John, these things are written that ye may believe. Okay, so right out of the gate, would it matter to believers if more was written? 
it's not going to matter to believers. But then what we end up thinking about, okay, it's not going to matter to believers. Would it matter to unbelievers? Would it matter to naysayers? If that which is written will not convince you, what makes you think more would convince you? If you're willing to reject that which is written, then what's going to stop you from rejecting more that is written? It's one of the points from the rich man and Lazarus. In Luke chapter 16, as you have that conversation happening between the rich man and Father Abraham, and you know it starts with the man asking for you know Lazarus. Um, you have the account of of, La of him saying, "Send Lazarus, dip his finger in water, cool my tongue." Verse twenty four. But then later on in the account, verse twenty seven, when he realizes that there's no hope for him because the gulf is there, he says in verse twenty seven, "I beg you, therefore, Father, you would send him to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment." And Abraham says, "They are Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. Let them hear them." And he says, "No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent." He says, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. It won't persuade them. All right? He says, if they're not going to hear Moses and the prophets, if they are set on disobeying God, is more of God's word going to convince them? No, their, their hearts and minds are set on it. Think about all the miracles that Jesus did. Okay, Think about all the ones we know about. Those people living back then... They saw the miracles that we don't even know about. Okay? They saw things. Think about Judas. Judas had a front row seat for three years to things that we don't know about. And what did he still do? Think about John chapter 6, verse 66. At that time, many disciples walked with him no more. They were privy, they were privy to things that me and you are not privy to. They saw things that that all we have, things that are just alluded to, that Jesus did many other things. Those people who left in John chapter 6, could Jesus have done anything or taught anything to keep them from leaving? Is it Jesus' fault that they left? Or did Jesus do everything that he could to teach them and try to persuade them? Right, Because that's what it comes down to. Was it Jesus' lack of teaching that, for whatever way, had an effect on them living? And of course the answer is no. It wouldn't have mattered. Jesus couldn't do anything other than forcibly keeping them there against their will, frankly, and that wouldn't have done anybody any good. So to think about it, um, the more there could have been more written. He did many other things. But, okay, if, if more was written, would it convince believers? No. Believers are convinced with what is written. Would it have convinced unbelievers? No. It wouldn't, it wouldn't do them any good either. It would not influence anyone. If they reject the Bible... It doesn't matter how many pages the Bible is. If they reject some, they'll reject all of it, frankly, is what it comes down to. And the Lord knew it. So, to get on to our third point, would it be any different if more was written? And to just think about that idea, come back to Luke 7. If more were, be if more were written, it would just be, frankly, more of the same. And we don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's just a factual way. In Luke chapter 7, when John the Baptist sends those messengers to him, or Luke 7, pardon me, Luke 7, at verse 22, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. If more were written, what would it include? Because he did a lot of things. <laughs> okay, so if more were written, what, what would be included? More crucifixions? No, he just goes to the cross once. We have the record of that. So it would be more teachings, right? 
But that doesn't mean different teachings at all. Okay, so you would have him teaching more of the same thing. Okay, would you have more healings? Right? Would you have more lepers being cleansed? Would you have more blind being healed and being able to see? Would you have more dead being raised? Yeah, you would have more of all those things. Right? But it, it's more of the same. We have those records that Jesus talks about. Right? When he says, this, go tell John the things you've seen and heard. We have each one of those things. Okay, so if there's another 20 volume set on top of the Bible, what are you going to read about? You're going to read anything different. No, it's going to be more of the same. It's going to be more of the same. It's going to be more of the same teaching and more of the same miracles to think about it. When it says he did many other things that were not written, that does not mean he did many other different things. Right? It, it, would, be, it would be more of the same. What we have in Scripture is we have a sample. That's what we have. And I don't think it's, it's wrong to think of it that way. It is a sample. When you take a sample of something, what do you have? You have the whole body of work, right? You have the whole whatever it is you're dealing with. Think about, oh, when I was trying to think of an analogy, the only one I could think of, and I'm not advocating for drinking and drunkenness, think about wine tasting, all right? So you have a huge, you have a huge vessel full of thousands of gallons, right? And what do they take from that huge volume? They take a sample. And if that sample is good, then what does that say about the whole vessel? It's good. Now to think about samples and to think about just how accurate, how accurate is the sample we have of Scripture? He did many other things that we don't know about. He did many other things that were not written. What we have is a sample. How accurate is our sample? How accurate of a portrayal of the whole thing is it? What do you think, 95%? 99%? Or do you think it's, yep, it's legit? It's legit. It's a good sample. The Holy Spirit is a little bit better about providing an accurate sample than man would be. And, and that's just the the facts of it. So why not write more? It wouldn't be any different. What would the purpose of it be? What would the purpose of it be? Right? It wouldn't benefit believers. We're convinced. It wouldn't benefit unbelievers. They'll just reject, they'll reject it anyway. And it, it wouldn't be any different. It would be more of the same. Now what would it result in? I want you to think about the Jews, the Jews' way of thinking and what was happening towards the end of the Old Testament times. And to think about what they were dealing with. Um, I believe in the second or third century, in the second or third century BC, you had the Old Testament being translated into Greek. It's the Septuagint, okay? I think it's second or third century BC, somewhere along those lines. We know it, it looks like it looks like Jesus actually quotes from the Septuagint, right, as it was translated into Greek. Scholars usually make that point. But you have the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, okay? Old Testament translated into Greek. But then you had all the elders' traditions, okay? And you had the oral traditions. Now, the problem with those oral traditions is what are they? Oh, they're oral. <laughs> Now, at some point, what are you going to do? You're going to think, well, maybe we ought to write down all these oral traditions so that people can read them. And lo and behold, what you end up with is what's called the Mishnah. All right? And you have, I think the Mishnah, I want to say it's something like 800 pages, depending on how big the font is, stuff like that. This picture of the Mishnah, you can see it's multiple volumes. And this is the or, these are the oral traditions, okay? So we've already gone from how thick is the Old Testament? Eh, it's got a little substance to it, right? And now, oh, remember what the, <laughs> you remember what the Pharisees said to Jesus and his disciples? You guys, are breaking the, you guys are breaking the traditions of the elders. Which traditions are those? That stuff. <laughs> not the stuff on the left. Not the, not the law. The Mishnah. The oral, the, all the oral law, the traditions, all, all that stuff. Now, the problem with that is, okay, so now you have all these oral 
the oral traditions that were written down in the Mishnah, now you got to explain the Mishnah. And that led to what's called the Talmud. And the Talmud is, oh, holy smokes. That's some, um, let me look at my notes. The Talmud is at least a dozen or more volumes. All right? So from the Jews' perspective, when they thought about the law and the prophets and the elders, what the elders said and all that good stuff, are they just talking about just, that, just the old law, as substantial as even the Old Testament is? Oh, no, it's, we're dealing with volumes. Those of you this evening who brought your Bible with you, how would you like it if you had to tote around 20 volumes? Josh, go ahead and come up here. Me and Josh arrange something. Josh is going to help me. Josh is going to help me out. To think about, j just consider the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is 24 pages, right? Ending with, go ahead and come up here. Ending with, he did many other things that were not written. So Josh is going to help me out. Okay, Josh, I told Josh I'd only have one question for him. Okay. He did many other things that were not written. He did them, <laughs> but we're dealing with why not write more? How much of the Bible do you want? All of it. All of it. Okay. Day one. Day one. You good? That's a southern thing. You're supposed to say, we good. We good. We All good. Right. All right. Those of you who brought your Bible tonight, tell me when to stop. You good? I'm good. Right? What's the end of John say? Hold them. It's the Bible, dude. When you want me to stop? Right? Now, hold on a second. He did many, if everything that was written, the world would not be, the world would not hold it. It doesn't say if everything was written, Josh wouldn't be able to hold it. It says the world would not hold it. We got to keep going. Right? All right. You're probably wondering, how many books does he have in that pulpit? We'll stop there. All right? All right. Bring your Bible to church next week. <laughs> That's just 10 books. That's just 10. Could the Holy Spirit have inspired 10 books? Easily. <laughs> Easily. Now, it's a thing. You okay? Yep. Strong yep. as an ox. The Gospel of John, 24 pages. The New Testament, a lot of folks have just a New Testament, fairly thin. Is it possible for a young fella to read the New Testament? Well, yeah. <laughs> How hard is it to read 24 pages, the Gospel of John? Well, that's not hard. Okay. How would you feel if you were... How old are you, Josh? 25. 25. How many 25-year-olds are going to say, okay... This is just the first week of the Lord's life. Read it. How many 25-year-olds how many are going to do that? How many 15-year-olds are going to do that? Will a teenager read the Gospel of John, though? Just for example. Sure. It makes us appreciate, it makes us appreciate what we have as... Because this is what the Jews were dealing with. They had the Septuagint. They had the Mishnah, they had the Talmud, and that sort of thought process could have gone on. But instead, what the Lord did was he said, okay, yep, my son did a lot of things. That's enough. Now, how much do you appreciate it? Thank you. Appreciate it, Josh. To, to think about how burdensome. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell. By the way, Josh, go ahead and bring down the rest of the books from upstairs, if you could. <laughs> <laughs>
How much of a burden would that be? To, if, if you had hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of volumes, to think about what it would turn into and what it would result in. There's nothing wrong with studying. The Lord wants us to study. The Lord wants us to read. The Lord wants us to meditate on Scripture. But, but what was happening, e even as the Old Testament time comes to a close, and you, have, you had rabbis who were spending all their days no in nothing else than constantly reading all these things that, were, that, that had been written, whether it's the Old Law, whether it's the Mishnah, whether it's the Talmud, all, you know, all these things. There's nothing wrong with reading. There's nothing wrong with studying. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But we have the passage in James where James says, and I'll quote it quickly, we're not only just supposed to be hearers of the word, what are we supposed to do? Be doers of the word. There's a time for hearing the word. We should hear the word. If you had a 500-volume set, Ooh, are you ever going to get through that 500 volume set? <laughs> Brace, you're a pretty good reader, aren't you? You like to read? Eh, depends on how much time he has, right? How long do you think would it take you to get through a 500 volume set? A long time. I'll tell you right now. Oh, I hate to ask this question. I don't want to make anyone feel bad. Jeff, you don't mind if I ask you a question, do you? You think you've read 500 books in your life? If everything was recorded, and I think just mathematically, we would never be able to read it all. The world would not contain all the books. We would never be able to read it all. So what, would, what it would result in, why not write more, we would just turn into theologians, and there's nothing wrong with theologians. We would just turn into people who did nothing but sat around and read all day long. And then when John says, okay, everybody, please turn to Matthew chapter 1,543, verse 849. <laughs> You'd say, hold on, I have to go back to the house. I don't have that volume with me. There... There's nothing wrong with hearing. We are supposed to be hearing the word. But even more than that, we're supposed to be doing the word. We can't do the word unless we first hear it. The hearing is not the end-all, be-all. Any more than faith is the end-all, be-all. It's faith and works. It's hearing and doing. At some point, we have to put it into, into practice. So we need, we need to study, and we need to meditate, and we need to talk about Scripture. And Scripture is already, how deep is Scripture? Just think about the Gospel of John again. I keep using that, that book. 24 pages. We could talk about that the rest of our lives. And would we ever fully explore everything, every little minute detail that the Lord possibly has for us? Would we ever, as we're plumbing the depths of the Gospel of John, will we ever hit bottom and say, oh, whew, we're finally done. Just 24 pages, and we can dig, dig, dig. Just with the Bible we have, we can dig all day long. And as we dig into it, and we keep thinking about it, and we keep studying on it, our faith grows. Our faith grows. That's how the Lord made it. But at some point, we have to put what we know into practice. We can't spend all our time just thinking about studying and such things as that. We actually have to put it into practice. So what would it result in if more would be written? Raise your hand if you want to. Raise your hand if you feel like going to seminary to study <laughs> the hundreds of volumes. That's not what the Lord intended. Nothing wrong with studying. Nothing wrong with going to school to learn more about the Bible, such things as that. But hopefully you understand the point. Back to our passage in John chapter 20. Back to our passage in John 20. And I'd like to read the two verses again. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. 
rather than focusing on what was not written. What we should do is focus on what was written and why it was written. These things are written that we may believe and believing that we may have life in his name. That's why it was written. What we have, that's why it was written, that we may believe and that we may have life in the name of Jesus. So as we offer the invitation to more, tonight, why not write more? It's because this is enough, if we're honest. If we're not honest, it'll never be enough. And more would just be more of the same. And if more was written, it would turn into something that the Lord didn't want it to turn into. So what was revealed is revealed. Do we, do we believe it? Are we convinced? Are we convinced? Do we believe? And do we have life in the Lord's name? That's what being a Christian is. Having life in the name of Jesus. So if you're here tonight, if you're not a Christian, as you think about the idea of what does it really mean to follow the Lord? What does it really mean to follow the Lord? These things are written that ye may believe. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight and need to respond in becoming a Christian, being baptized for the remission of your sins, having life in Jesus, having life. You just might think about the beauty of that phrase. Is Jesus about dying? Well, one aspect, right? Because you have the cross. Is Jesus is following the Lord about dying? Yeah, you have the cross, and you have us denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily. But is that the end of it? No. The cross wasn't the end for Jesus. You have the resurrection. You have the ascension. What is it for us? We are raised to walk in newness of life. I have come that they may have life, right? Death may be a part of that, but it's only a part of it in the sense of a man must be born again. A man must be born again. The lesson's yours. If you're here this evening and need to respond, please come.